in this super exciting episode of Mind Pump. So, of course, we talk about fitness, health, nutrition, fat loss, muscle building, but we also cover current events and our own personal lives. Ooh, we get personal. We do that stuff in the first 44 minutes of this episode. It's the intro portion. Here's what we talked about. We started by talking about our favorite candy of all time. I brought some candy for the guys here uh, at the studio. Yeah, no Reese's Cups, though. Yeah, trying Whatever, to get, dude. The fatter they get, the leaner I look. <laughs> uh, then we talked about the new Mirror Thermos cup that we got. It's a double wall vacuum insulated uh, thermos. It's phenomenal. It says, stay authentic on it. Um, it's amazing. Mirror, of course, makes phenomenal the best. products. The best mugs, cups, and thermoses. Um, it, and we are sponsored by them. So if you go to mirror.com, that's M-I-I-R.com, and use the code MINDPUMP, you'll get a full 25% off your order. So a full quarter of the price of your order will be waived with our discount. Then we talked about blue light studies. So studies on blue light, how it affects our sleep, athletic performance, and how it can be potentially connected to cancer through reducing our melatonin production. Now, one of the easiest ways you can protect yourself from the effects of blue light at night is to wear blue light blocking glasses. Now, our favorite company is Felix Gray. They are one of our sponsors. They have blue light blocking glasses that are not orange. They're clear, but they're powerful. They still block the blue light, but so but you don't look like a dork wearing orange glasses. Yes, thank you. So here's what you do. Go to Felix Gray Glasses. That's Felix, F-E-L-I-X. Gray is G-R-A-Y. Glasses.com forward slash mind pump. And you'll get free shipping and free returns on the Felix Gray glasses that you choose. Then Justin talked about his brand new pet. It's a cat. Meow. But it's designed It's designed to kill all the rats in his backyard. It's got a little bit of a crazy it's cat. a little murderer. Then I talked about the cyber attack that we did towards Iran for shooting down one of our drones. Apparently, we kicked their butt from behind our desk. Geek squad, ho! <laughs> then we talked about how the new iPhone and Bill Burr special coming out on September 10th. That's going to be a great day. We talked about how phone pouches are being used in schools to lock kids' phones so they can focus better. And uh, then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. The first question, this person wants to know when you're ready to start cutting. Like, how do you know it's time to cut your calories to get leaner? And also, what's the best way to cycle between cutting and bulking? So we've talked about in the past how intermittently increasing your calories will help you in the long term, burn body fat and vice versa, how that may help people who want to build muscle. So we talk all about that in that part of this episode. Next question, this person wants to know what all the benefits are of the farmer's walk. Farmer's walk is an exercise that we have in a couple of our programs, Map Strong being one of them. What are the benefits? Does it help you build muscle? Does it make you stronger? And what parts of your body does it work on? Farmersonly.com. The next question, uh, this person wants to know what our thoughts are on powder-based meal replacement shakes. There's companies out there that are saying that their shakes can replace meals. There's even one company out there that says you could just have their shakes and never eat real food again. As crazy and insane as it sounds, some people are doing this. So we give our educated opinions on that. Don't be an idiot. And the following, the, the final question, this person wants to know uh, what we think about having a healthy relationship with money. Now, I know we're trainers and fitness enthusiasts. And we're not experts. But we're so much more, Sal. Yeah. We're not experts in money at all. But there are a lot of uh, anal- comparisons between how you are with food, how you are with exercise, and how you might treat oh, money. It's right there in front of us. Good relationships are good relationships, and pathological ones are still bad. And so we give our opinions on that with money. Also, one day left. That's it. This is the final day for the MAPS Prime and Prime Pro 50% off sale. After today, the price goes up. It doubles, and it won't go down again for a very, very long time. Now, remember, MAPS Prime teaches you how to prime your body before your workouts. Now, priming is like warming up, but much, much more. First off, it's individualized. So you take a test in the Prime program. It tells you what parts of your body you need to focus on, what movements you need to do to prime your body properly. It improves mobility, gives you greater ranges of motion, helps you activate more muscle fibers. In other words, a good 10-minute priming session will make your current workout far more effective. Now, MAPS Prime Pro, well, that's all about correctional exercise. If you have aches and pains, mobility issues, poor posture, you need to get better at your squats, your deadlifts, your overhead presses, it may may have to do with the mobility in your shoulders, your hips, your knees, 
your wrists, your hands, your feet, maybe even your neck. Well, MAPS Prime Pro addresses all those areas and teaches you how to apply correctional exercise to get better movement and less pain. That program is also 50% off. So here's what you do for both MAPS Prime and Prime Pro for the discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0. No space for the discount. You guys know what this is right here? I'll make the sound so the audience knows. That's a bag. Yeah, it is you a bag. See what's in the bag? Oh, wow. Candy. Fucking candy. But it's not just any candy. How dare you? We're a fitness podcast. It's the real... Yeah, I know, dude. You but know what's funny? Every once in a while I have candy. You are. if, And I think... I, so I used to have a candy addiction, and I've openly admitted that. But if mm. there, if someone is going to buy a box of candy at the airport... This guy. You. Or, yeah. Organic. Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> organic. <laughs> you know what's funny? I, eat, I I have candy... You never do. Never. Yeah, like maybe, never. maybe once... Just every, with us. Once apparently. every like couple months or something well, like once that. Well, once, literally... once every... I mean, we fly a lot, right? So we probably fly at least 10 to 12 times a year. And I would say every second or third flight I can you walk over and you're like hey you want some yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it'll be like <laughs> some Mentos Starburst or yeah. something yeah, yeah something fruity and chewy <laughs> yeah. but see they never have the good stuff because the good stuff is too it's too old school and cheap like see what's in this bag right here I'll yeah, pull like, the first one out it's like I'll, what my grandma would give me but that's the good shit here's the yeah, first one the Werther's Originals Butterscotch oh, oh yeah look at Doug yeah, right. look at Doug's face scotch. right now He's happy. Yeah, Dude, oh, I went through Scotland trying to find this butterscotch liqueur that didn't exist. No, anymore. butterscotch discs. So my grandma, and by the way, I eat candy very annoyingly. If you've ever watched me eat hard candy, <laughs> not like that. Oh, you know, how are you supposed to eat hard you candy? You're supposed to put it in your mouth, let it dissolve, right? Yeah. Not me, dude. In my mouth, choo choo choo. No, no, choo choo choo. Next one, choo choo. It's like I eat it like it's. Oh, you, you eat hard candy it. like that? Like it's food. Oh, that is. You don't right. suck it? No, no, no. You suck Come it. Come on, dude. You guys suck it. Now look at this one. This is the one that got Adam all excited. You the saw barrel. It? The barrel. You saw this, is dude. Is it a barrel? Look at this. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> Dad. Oh, you dropped it. Dad's. Oh. Dad's root beer candy. Yeah. Nobody makes that anymore. That is good. Yeah, and here's the other one. This is one of my favorite. I know a lot of people don't like this. Don't my give favorite, me any though. Laffy Taffy. Oh, you do. Banana oh, Laffy banana. Taffy? Banana. That's the best. Dude, banana. No, yeah. terrible. You don't like Banana Laffy Taffy? Any, what is Any root? banana candy can what just is go to hell. Beer? Huh? What is root beer? It's, it's a root. A, it's, uh, it's, is it, Doug? Do you want root beer or butterscotch? Root Justin? beer, bro. Right, here you go. What, what gives root beer flavor? Uh, the sarsaparilla. Root. Yeah, sarsaparilla. used to be sarsaparilla root. I don't think they make that anymore with sarsaparilla root. Is that is that true? You just you can buy out. sarsaparilla. So here's the deal. I don't know if it's true, but it came out of my mind and my mouth. I'm gonna have Doug check up on it. Yeah. Beca- am I right? Yeah. What is root beer made out of? Well, it did start as sarsaparilla. There's, are there, are there, there's, there's actually drink. a licorice root. Oh, it's a lick. Mm. Oh, see now that's it. Does, now that you think of it, say that it does have like a black licorice kind of aftertaste. Mm. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Let's see. Why is root beer called that? Uh, it's got cherry bark. Wow, mm. winter green. vanilla cherry bark, winter molasses, green molasses, licorice root. There, there's okay. Anise. Yeah, I taste the licorice. Mm-hmm. I loved dude, growing up when I was a kid. If there was root beer, oh, you got me done. Yeah, done deal. Yeah, Every, root beer floats all day. Mm-hmm. Nobody drinks root beer anymore, do they? I had. A root, uh, I do. I'm on this right now. I'm on. What's the? Uh, this is the best fitness podcast in health that anyone's uh, ever heard, right? So. <laughs> I, I don't know if I've told you guys. You guys haven't asked me about this in a long time. We used to talk about it on the show quite a bit. How oh, dare us. About my Diet Coke addiction. Mm. Um, I gave up. That's why. I, well, I've kicked it, ironically. Maybe because you were bugging me. I was like, fuck, Sal. I'm going to have a Diet Coke. I'm like, I'm going to leave him alone. Yeah, I'm yeah, making him yeah, drink more. You are. <laughs> that's so my personality, too. Yeah, no. Fucking tell me you drink Diet Coke. Yeah, fuck yeah. you. I'm going to so, have another one. I told Justice, it's not bring it up anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We made a pact. So I haven't had one in like forever, right? And I what I made the switch first to the like Lacroix and like the kind of you know. <laughs> I stay away from that because it's French. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> I can't pronounce it right. <laughs> just, <laughs> just sounds all like you know pretentious, up, uppity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So I I switched to those first, and I, I I guess it's just the carbonation that that was the T- thing. It tastes like water that was dreaming about strawberries. That's what <laughs> yeah. it tastes like. <laughs> 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 like a very hint. Yeah. yeah. Well, it worked. It, it got me away from it. And then when I have a sweet tooth now, um, I keep like a, I buy them in six packs. I have the Hansen's Real Cane Sugar Root Beer. Oh, that's not bad. That's actually a not bad version. No, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm like, if I really want, if I'm like really craving the sugar or really want. Dad's is the best though. No, no, no. You don't A&W. like Dad's? 
Oh yeah, they're good too. A W all day. Yeah, they're good too. Yeah, yeah. but this creamy. Hansen is delicious. A little bit better for you. Mm. Why? Because they use real. You've had Henry Weinhardt's. Yeah. Oh, that one's that one's. No, bad. I haven't had that. Oh one. yeah, that's a little more adult. No, and and you're right. Nobody has adult. root beer floats anymore. Oh, I do. What kind of a father am I? I haven't I, even given my kid oh, one. That's yeah. A, we really? had that for uh, my oldest, his birthday. That's what he wanted for his, instead of cake, we did that. That's like pure. It it's so much sugar. Oh dude. my God. Oh, man. Maybe I'm a good father. That's why yeah, I'm that's why. It. <laughs> it's terrible. It's like mainlining them with no, sugar. No, I was in, I was in Campbell and there's this, uh, this candy store called, uh, what's it called here? Rocket Fizz. And you oh, walk God. in there and they've got all these old like pictures and stuff on the wall and candies that you could pick from. And because it's a candy store, you can find candy that you don't always find. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like the biggest. I love cheap, shitty candy the most. Like I like, I like those those long, skinny rolls of the little circle. It was Sweeties. Oh uh, yeah. You know, what I, mean? I like simple candy, sugar, and maybe a little bit of color, and then I'm good. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Then I'm set. Like the pixie dust, uh, dust ones, where you'd like, you know, eat it with a, a sugar scooper. Yeah, you know, it was like a hard sugar scooper. Pixie, that you eat. pixie sticks were the, was the laziest candy I've ever heard of yeah. in my life. <laughs> just so, sugar, yeah. hey, what do we, yeah, sugar in a straw. Dust. Hey, boss, what do we do with all this leftover sugar over here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just throw in a straw. <laughs> yeah, give it to kids. Yeah, throw so, some food coloring on. They'll it. eat that shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, did you guys see our new uh, our new cool water bottles over here? Dude, they're gorgeous. Dude, badass. I know. I'm pretty excited. So uh, I think we talked about uh, our- what are they? They're flat. Hey, Andrew, throw me that. We could. This is oh, on video oh, oh, now. Oh boy! Oh boy! You know what I mean? Oh boy! Hold on. Well, I mean, you don't know, get hit we, here. Ah! You see that? I'm gonna Vanna White this for everybody on YouTube. So that's a flask. Yeah, that's like a thermos, right? It's got that's a legit insulated. Size. Yeah. What's cool about those? I mean, you could put you could put something hot or cold in it, right? And for 24 hours, it'll keep it at like that temperature. So if you're like you could put. If you were to put hot coffee in there, I wouldn't put hot coffee in there, but you could put hot coffee in there, and then the within for twenty four hours it'll stay hot. Do you guys remember the kid in school that always brought uh, like hot soup and chicken yeah, soup in his, yeah. in his thermos? My buddy did that. But did he do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like <laughs> he I was, was a rich kid, dude. Was he? Yeah. If you had, if you had a nice thermos that you got soup, and then he always had like a treat like inside there. His mom always had baked fresh baked cookies. Yeah. It's my best friend had all that. See, not me, dude. My mom is like personal that. chef. Put it together. No, my mom would give me pasta and be in a Tupperware. You know what I mean? Stained. So with do the you sauce. guys? Do you guys use these? Like I use. These all the time. This now. is like my water bottle, <coughs> dude. I bring it everywhere. I yeah. love the size of it. Well, I, could, I like could, them because they they do they they maintain the temperature. So if you leave it in the car or whatever, you don't you know it's not like ten minutes later it's, it's boiling hot or whatever. Yeah, and I think Mir does the best. I, I, this not only just the style of it, like the handle of it, how you hold on to it, the seal, like. I forget what they, I mean, the way it's double, triple insulated is like top of the line stuff. So all their and what's cool about Mir is. They don't. They don't just have their their own mirror cups and products. You can actually white label, which is what this is right here. So mirror is somebody that we work with, a partnership that we have, uh, but we actually white label it. So we have our logo. So it our says branding. Stay, stay authentic on the side, mm -hmm. and it's ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's double wall vacuum insulated. So there's two layers of uh, insulation or, that prevent it from transferring energy. So it's not gonna. So if it's hot in there. It's going to stay hot. If it's cold in there, it's going to stay cold. You know what I like these flasks for? Stuff like that. It was one of the more... And this is... It's so funny. As a trainer, you learn what gets your clients to, to do new behaviors and what doesn't. And sometimes it's the dumbest, stupidest thing, but it's one of the most effective things. One of the difficult things I, uh, difficult, uh, uh, things I used to have trouble with with clients was getting them to dr drink more water. Um, not mm -hmm. all my clients had issues with that, but the ones that did, it was so hard. It was so hard to get them to drink more water. Oh, I don't think about it. I'm not thirsty. You know, it's this and that. And I'd be like, oh, you know, look, if your urine's really dark anymore, oh yeah, I was definitely needed more water, but I just forgot. Uh, but I don't want to drink, you know, five glasses before going to bed. Mm -hmm. So I was always trying to find ways of getting them to drink more water. And the dumbest thing ever was one of the more effective things was to get them to buy a big flask like that. And I'd say, here, fill this up with water and then just know that it needs to be done by the end of the day. This exactly. Is, That's this, it. It's so dumb. This it is, worked. This is why I, I remember early on, you know, I remember you guys ragging on the, the meatheads that carry right. the gallon of water around. And it was a game changer for me. I was somebody who didn't drink enough water. And when I actually started to track and I was like, okay, let me carry a gallon and then see like what, like, and not try to crush it. This was before I tried to get a gallon. I was like, I just want to see what I'm doing. Now I just had to discipline myself to drink out of the same thing so I could track it. 
I was grossly under oh, under yeah. drinking water. I had a moment like that where I realized, you know, besides just, you know, introducing more mobility so I could alleviate a lot of pain from all these fixed positions that I was in all day long, you know, hydrating more really helped to alleviate, you know, and give my joints more lubrication so I didn't get, you know, all that pain. Everybody's always searching for the next supplement to give them a better pump, okay? Oh, I mean, there's a whole market around supplements that give you a better. Dude, let's pump. sell water right now. What, I swear to God, mm -hmm. I, this took me a long time mm -hmm. to put together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you, if I drink, if I made a point to have a lot of water. Now, I'm not talking about like overdoing it because you can overdo water, and in fact, it could be quite dangerous. I mean, just drink like I'm supposed to drink a decent amount of water before my workout. Uh, my pumps are always. I'm gonna so much better. I'm gonna push you further on that because for it's a half gallon for me. I've got it down to a science. I know wow. exactly what it is. Oh yeah, like, you met, you, you waited marked it off. Yeah. And oh, totally. And, and that was such a game changer for me. It's and, so silly. And I'm a tall, so I'm a tall guy. So I have big, probably long muscle belly. So I'm, maybe a gallon's a lot for somebody who's listening. They're five ten and you know 180 pounds or whatever. But for me, if I had a, if I put down a half gallon of water, like within the hour going to the gym and at the gym. By the time that half gallon got in me and I started getting getting pumped up, I would look. And now what time of the day are you working out? So I'm at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So was, half a gallon of water up to by 1 o'clock. Yes. Yeah. And it makes sense. If you're yeah. drinking a full gallon, that's about halfway through the day. Right. How soon did it sense. take for you to acclimate so you didn't go have to go pee all the time? So that takes a while. And that was probably the hardest part, I'd say, when I rel realized that I wasn't getting enough water and then started pushing myself to drink more more consistently. And I, I have it, it. Just runs in my family. My uncle's got it. My aunt, my, my, my everybody in my family have small bladders. So, you know, I'm going. I was going pee multiple times in the hour. That was the most annoying part about. But it, it does after a while. You don't do. You don't pee as much. Yeah, you yeah, you do a long time. You do. You get. It takes a little while to get acclimated to that, and then you do, and then it's not as bad. But that's just something that I had to get used to. Was, but it's what a game changer. Such a silly thing is just to be very hydrated. Oh look, I got a great pump, and it's way better than the pre-workout citrulline whatever supplement oh, yeah. that well, I was taking before. At the same time that I was starting to figure this out, like about that I was not drinking enough water, I was also, anytime I went really heavy on squats, uh, I would get this like pop in my quad. And it was really weird, a weird feeling that I have and it would be really painful. It'd scare me every time and then I'd stop squatting and this was all around the same time. And when I started hydrating big time, went away completely. <laughs> I, I never had that issue ever again. So the most common uh, uh, feedback that I would get from clients who we know we, we noticed that they weren't drinking enough water and then we got them to drink more water, the number one comment I would get would be like, my back pain's gone. Yeah. My stiffness is gone. It's I'm true, not, dude. And I remember at first being like, eh, this is a coincidence. This is a correlation. It's not... But then it happened so often, it was 100% predictable. And it's true, to, if you're ever dehydrated or just not drinking enough water, you're just stiffer. You're yeah. just more stiff. Drink an adequate amount of water, you're more lubricated. You move better. And it makes sense. Your body's made up of so much water. Right. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's, lube up. And one of the most... <laughs> Justin. What? It's, it's true. <laughs> one of the best um, techniques I ever, got, I ever used to get clients to drink more was to have them carry around... A container that had a lot of water, like a flask, like the one where we we have now, the Stay Authentic Mirror Flask, because you fill it up, you know, you know, in it is half a gallon of water, or you know, two thirds of a gallon of water, or whatever, however much is in there, and you know, as you're looking at it, you can see how much you've drunk. But besides, and that's more effective than drinking glasses of water, I think, because you tend to lose track, you tend to lose track of how much water you've you've had and how much water you need. So, anyway, it's funny, great, great story. Um, so, uh, I. Article I just read about um, blue light and blue light's effects on our health. They did one on athletes, mm. and they found that uh, having the athletes wear blue light blocking glasses got them on average to sleep seven minutes faster, but also dramatically improved the rating that they gave the quality of their sleep from an average of six to ten. And this is on a scale of I think it was one to ten. So. Their quality went through the roof and they fell asleep much faster. And people think, well, is that really a big difference? It definitely is. If you start to add up, oh yeah, you start to add up seven minutes of sleep uh, throughout the week. What does that turn into? Yeah, forty nine minutes of sleep for the week. Right. Add that up over the course of two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month, months, 
And now you can see how those little... Oh, yeah. And you're a high-performing athlete. Every little bit of recovery that you can add into your routine is going to make a, you know massive waves. All, yeah, they make a big difference. Well, I really think that's the... The biggest thing that when I talk about like wearing my Felix Grays every night, the big thing is this, is I just notice that I fall asleep faster. Yeah. I, I notice that when, if, if and here's the thing, if I don't even wear my glasses, but I, I do a lot of the right things, like I eat earlier, I've exercised much earlier in the day, I'm hydrated, I don't over consume my food, I turn down, I turn off my computer and my phone by when the sun goes down, my lights are dim. Oh, I, I go to bed just fine. But the reality is that I don't do that a lot of times. A lot of times I work out later than what I'd like to. A lot of times I'm watching TV till 10 o'clock at night. A lot of times I'm in bed and I'm on my phone and I'm doing these things. And when I do that and I don't wear my glasses, I notice that it's it, I spend an extra 20 to 30 minutes, it feels mm -hmm. like for me, okay, mm. for me to finally fall asleep. Now, when I discipline myself that, okay, if I'm going to be on my phone, I'm going to be on the computer or TV, whatever, past the sun going down, if I just discipline myself to throw my glasses on and then I do all those same things, I notice that I can fall right to sleep and it doesn't take that 20 to 30 minutes. That is the biggest difference that's that I know. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely something to this circadian rhythms and, you know, like how you're, you're, your body, it's just like a switch that goes off, you know, it's like, it, you know, this is the, the second half of the day and like your body, like just knows that like we're shutting down and cause I've gone through that whole thing where I dim the lights and I like calm down, try to calm, but I didn't put the glasses on and the glasses were, you know, that extra step that was even more impactful. For yeah. Me. The two simple things you can do in a regular modern life that don't require a ton of change. Cause that's the other thing too, is I can go through and list all the things you can do, but some of them are difficult to implement in, because our lives are busy or whatever. But the two most effective things you can do to get your circadian rhythm to be balanced is get sun exposure during the day. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference. This is one of the reasons why you'll notice when you're at the beach all day or at the pool or at the park, you go home and you sleep so good at night. And if you have kids, you notice this. Like yeah. Your kids are outside during the day. They sleep really, really good at night. So that's number one. And then the second one is to minimize your exposure to the most uh, offensive form of light in terms of our circadian rhythm, which is blue light. Now, now I'm, I, Harvard did this whole article on blue light's effect on our health, and they compared blue light to other forms of light, and they found that blue light suppressed melatonin f twice as long as green light. So between three out uh, from suppressing it from what for one and a half hours, it suppressed it for three hours. And they also found that it, sh it shifted circadian rhythm by about twice as much mm. as well. Wow. So yeah, wearing that's substantial. Yeah, and so they're saying wearing blue light blocking glasses is uh, a, a good, easy way to kind of minimize that. Mm. But they're also saying that they think it'll probably reduce cancer risk because what we're finding now is that the, there's a higher when your circadian rhythm's off. If you're like a shift worker, or you're you know if you don't get good sleep or whatever, there's a direct relationship or strong correlation to cancer risk. Well, the article I read from Harvard says that they theorize that it's because of the depressed melatonin because we're finding that melatonin's got anti-cancer effects. And when your melatonin is low, then uh, that, t that tends to increase the rate at which you get um, cancers. So it's not just feeling like shit and, you know, they're, they're showing connections to diabetes, the way your, your body uh, works with sugars, the way your body burns body fat, cancer too. Wow. So it's a, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Um, and it's just an easy fix because ideally, here's the deal. Ideally, what you want to do is this. When the sun goes down, you want your house to be dark. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the ideal perfect situation. You want to match the sun that's outside your house. So if you look outside, oh, the sun is setting, turn all the lights down. And let's use really low light or red glowing lights. Or uh, fire candles. Yeah, candle. fire candles or like I use um, uh, Himalayan, Himalayan salt. salt lamps. But I know that that's not pragmatic for most people. It's low light. It's not You can't do homework in that light. You're not going to be able to really read a lot in that light. Um, you're not going to bump into things, but it's, it's not ideal for a lot of people. But that's the ideal perfect scenario. Now, if you're not one of those fanatics or you don't, you know, you're not like me and you're like going to turn everything off and do all that stuff. Just pair of blue light blocking glasses. Super right. easy. Yep. Put right. them on and it's not as good, but it's way better than doing nothing Thank at all. Thank God we have options now that aren't sort of dorky. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, they're, they're considering people like me. Oh, that's a. I was. I, I don't care how hard you sold me on on all of this until like we found a brand like Felix Gray that the style looks good and it's. And for me, the other thing that I didn't like, I remember when we first started messing with blue blockers. This was well before we even partnered with Felix Gray. What you had those orange ones that you were wearing, Sal, and I'm just like, fuck this, bro. <laughs> Aside from you looking real like a dork, like real futuristic, also, dude. It also ruins your experience watching the movie because it completely changes all the colors in the movie. Like, and I watch TV at night, and that's part of part of the time that we watch TV. Unfortunately, is when the sun goes down, and I, and I know that's not ideal for my circadian yeah, but rhythm. That's, that's TV time for yeah, most people, right? So I was, and I was trying to do the, you know, what would be better for me. So I was wearing these orange blue blockers and now i'm like oh i couldn't do it i couldn't do it consistently because there'd be a show that is you know graphically appealing and then and yeah, you're then watching just, like discovery earth yeah <laughs> yeah and then you're watching <laughs> it, it it's all the colors are all distorted and like that's not this is like this isn't working for me you know so it was i was inconsistent but since we've since felix gray has the the clear lenses and it doesn't distort it like that that's it's been really easy. and they have the two options. They have the one that you wear because here's the other thing about blue light: uh, constant exposure during the day. Uh, there's a certain type of blue light that can be damaging to your eyes if you're looking at it for too long. This may be why people who work on computers all day long get that eye strain mm -hmm. or the headaches that they start to feel, and they're finding that it may even be may even have some detrimental effect on their on their vision. Oh, beyond, yeah, because, I mean, I have to wear glasses when I read for a certain amount of time, and I was wearing just regular glasses, you know, with prescription, and found that I would still get a bit of eye strain to where I would get headaches if it was like a certain amount of time on there. And then I finally got the prescription ones with the blue light blocking and made a big difference right. with that. Right, and so what you don't want to do is wear like 100% or super powerful blue light blocking glasses during the day because then your brain will perceive that it's nighttime and it's daytime. You don't want your brain to think it's nighttime when it's daytime and vice mm -hmm. versa. Mm -hmm. But there are there is a certain um, frequency of or, or, or type of blue light that is more damaging than others. And so the Felix Ray daytime ones block the bad type that damage your eyes, but then also allow you to work during the day and your brain not think it's nighttime. Then they have the nighttime blue light, blue light blocking ones, which are more like what you're talking about, Adam, so where I, it blocks most of it out. Right. I keep those ones up next to my, my nightstand by my bed, yeah. which is if I do something like a bad habit, like get on my phone when I'm laying in bed, which can mm. happen. And then I keep the other ones downstairs in the kitchen and the living room area where if I'm like watching TV or doing something like mm -hmm. that when it's like eight o'clock, sun's down, but I'm not trying to fall asleep yet, but I'm still mm -hmm. working, Dude, doing it, things. It's, this is such a great example too of an area where um, I've changed my mind completely. I remember when we first went to the first Paleo FX the hippies convention. finally won me over. And yeah, we were like, you know, making fun of people like you're wearing glasses yeah. or so down, like whatever. <laughs> And then you know, more and more, and then the science started coming out, and I'm reading more and more of the science. And I'm like, oh shit, there's something to this. Totally. This actually makes, and it's just a modern solution for a modern problem. Mm. But at the end of the day, just like it is with nutrition, ideally, you want to get all your nutrients from food. I think you could still be a pretentious turd about it, though. I really do. You can be. Yeah. You sure could. Yeah, I think you could still be a turd about it. I think that there's. <laughs> There's a, there's a limit to it, and it's, it gets a, it gets annoying. Like you don't see me wearing my blue blockers all the time. Like I if I know that I'm going to be working on or my when phone. You're on a date. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, if I know I'm going to be working on my phone, and ask me about my glasses or yeah. in front of the computer <laughs> for extended periods of time. I know it's a, it's it's a good choice for me to probably put those on. So if you're somebody who I guess works in front of a computer all day long, it makes sense to me. Yeah, you got to do it for you to be wearing. You it, guys look good in glasses too. You think so? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you wear yours. I, I pretend to be smart for me. Yeah, I know you wear yours half the time because you think they look good. They do. They do look no, good. No, I wear I wear them a lot because I notice a big difference when I'm in, buried in my phone. Nothing makes gives me the eye strain and the uh, headache more than you know four hours plus of social media are you, time. Are you prone to headaches? Do you get them? No, not really. Really, not, that's just something that is one of those things that it does that to. Really, like, mm. if I'm staring at my phone, computer is not as bad as the phone is the worst for me. And I don't know if it's because it's smaller, brighter. What it, whatever it is, but staring at my phone, when I start getting beyond the one hour, two hour plus mark, of uh, which is pretty much almost every day with all the stuff that we do, mm -hmm. I, I start to get this headache. And I feel, and it starts with the eye strain first, where I'm kind of like blinking my eyes and it's bothering yeah. me a little bit. And then it turns into a headache. If I, if I push through it, because I have stuff to do and I'm like I can't stop and I and I know I have to and I don't have my glasses on then I notice I got, I have my kids trained now my yeah. my my son is especially he's 
trained. He has a pair right yeah, next to it. It's all ritual now. Oh, it's yeah. The same no, thing. no, when he's on there, he, he puts them on. Every, yeah. I've really done a good job of, of convincing him, like, this is a big deal. You need to do this because, especially now, uh, kids are they're just in front of screens the majority of the time. I mean, and I'm not talking to play video games. I'm talking to just do homework. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're never looking at books. No. It's always it's on the computer screen. Screens. Did I tell you guys about my rat problem? What? What? Yeah. I have like a crazy rat problem. Outside. At your house? Yeah. Oh. I don't know if this is like wood rats or like- Is this because of the specific chickens? specific kind. Yeah. They've attracted them because of all their food and like we throw uh, them all our scraps and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one rat found, you know, ooh, this is, uh, you know, a well that I can keep going back to. And they went and, and made a nest out of one of the stumps that's outside. And we've just had, like, they're getting more bold and more out in the open every day. Like, there's one that was on the deck and it was just like staring at us as we're watching TV. And I'm like, we got to fucking do something about this. You felt like you were getting punked? Yeah. And he's just like, hey, you're not going to do anything. So, what are you going to do? Eat this. So, what do you do? So, I mean, so we looked at, uh, first, I got all these traps. And so I got the ones that snap their little bodies in, in half. You know, <laughs> you're welcome, vegans. And um, I did that for a while. But you didn't eat them? No, I didn't eat them. Okay, no, good. no, this was not, yeah, we could eat rat. Yeah, no, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. No. You would if you weren't alone. You would. If you're yeah, on alone. one of those survivor shows, yes, I don't you know how they do that. Yeah, you would eat a rat for uh, sure. I wonder what it tastes like. Yeah. But uh, no, so that wasn't working after all because they get really smart. So- they, I'm, I'm sure it's like the scent or whatever, like as you're putting the bait on there or they just like are better about like getting it without getting caught in it. So e- either way it wasn't working. And so I was like, man, what am I gonna do? I got, I don't really want to do the poison thing uh, because I got a dog too and chickens, all these like my kids and everything. Yeah. So I was like looking at options and Courtney actually was doing some research and found that there's this program through, I don't know if it's the SPCA, but uh, they have these cats that are feral that they, that they basically, they, um, they bring into the shelter and they're trying to find homes for. And so they act as like barn cats. So you, you put them on your property. It's really low maintenance. Like you just have to keep them there for three weeks. So they recognize that this is their new home Yeah. and you like give them water and food and you keep them in this, in this cage, basically the shelter, uh, you know, for three weeks. And then after that, it's like, they're they're on their own and they're just like hunters. Oh wow! So it's like in in you know introducing a new predator into our little ecosystem. Do cats or you ever guys ever watch a cat hunt outside? Yeah, yeah. they're little lions. They're badass, dude. They kill more birds than anything else, dude. They're little like they. I saw my cousin had a cat that was uh, I swear to God two steps away from a lion. This he was furry and orange, and you'd watch him walk through the grass and just pounce. On shit, and I'm yeah. like, and he was a little badass. Yeah. So, did you get it yet? Yeah, we got him. We got him yesterday. What's oh, you name? did, boy, yeah. girl. Oh, yeah, so it? it's a it's a boy. We named him Hobbs because he looks like a, a tiger. Oh, like Calvin oh, and Hobbs. Wow. Yeah, Calvin and Hobbs. Now, yeah. is this why you're doing you? You did the whole conspiracy thing about the Black Plague or whatever about rats? Yeah, it freaked <laughs> me out, dude. <laughs> I went down the rabbit hole because I I was like, man. I can't be the only one that's having like rat. I keep hearing about rat problems. And I listened to other podcasts and they were talking about some documentary uh, in New York. They were like looking into it and it's gotten way worse, like right under our, our nose. Like they're just, they embed themselves in walls and I guarantee like your house has rats. You don't even realize it. Mm. And so that freaked me, that freaked me out. Cause they still carry that. Uh, I don't know, whatever it is that, that create the bubonic plague. They mm-hmm. carry some kind of, form a strain of that that uh, and then uh, you know on top of that and then you, you start thinking about like anyways like people that are you know the, like defecating everywhere you know homeless and all that yeah. and then like that that's a recipe for the black plague mm. so <laughs> I, I got freaked out dude because there's a lot of homeless encampments around well i'm excited to hear the the journey of hobbs i want to hear how this goes yeah, yeah, yeah. i hope he's a killing machine you yeah. know we'll, we'll, we'll see I'm that's curious a, if he kills your chickens. That's what I, he <laughs> might. He <laughs> might do that. Oh, that would suck. I mean, if they, they like birds already, those are pretty easy birds. Yeah, to like, kill. come on, man! I need my yeah. eggs, yeah. dude. Love those eggs. Yeah. They're, did you, they're producers. Did you guys hear about the cyber attack uh, that we launched towards Iran? No. So you know how they shot down one of our drones? Yeah. So they shot down one of our drones. I'm going to pull up the article because it's kind of crazy. Shortly afterwards, we put our cyber security or cyber soldiers or whatever. Um, what are the bunch of nerds behind computers? Yeah. But but for war. Yeah, let's get them. But for war. 
So I guess this just had this weird visual of it. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. so you here's what the article says: U.S. cyber military forces brought Spells down bullets. a database used by the Iranian uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps that was used to target ships in the Persian Gulf. So hours after they shot down one of our drones, our cyber military went in and just fucking just wiped out their their database, killed their computers. Wow. Yeah. This is the future. Awesome. This is the future of war. If you, that's why I thought it was so fascinating. Well, imagine how I mean. That's it is it interesting. Is it's an interesting topic because we we always talk about the scare of like nuclear bombs and things like that. But well, man, you want to cyber dem- threats? Are could real, you imagine man. if somebody came in and had the ability to just like shut down the banking system? Yeah, or like, something like that. Like wipe, just wipe out like all internet oh, you have no access, access to all internet access and connections to everybody across the world simultaneously or in the U.S. Mm-hmm. simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Boom! All of a sudden, done. Like think of like the like the economic damage and anarchy. destruction would be um would be immeasurable. It would yeah. be a, a, such a terrible blow to an advanced nation. Mm. I mean, one of the worst. I mean, imagine if they went in and wiped out everybody's debt. That would be people think that's cool. That would be terrible for the financial system, and nobody would step forward and be like, "Oh, well, here's what my debt was." But I don't. Know, I had no debt. What are you talking about? Yeah. It would be a terror. Like there's so many different well, ways just, just you can attack. Like, a country. I mean, all of the, all the banking system is all of our tracking of our money is all through a computer. So imagine if it just wiped out everybody's bank statement. Like mm. you all of a sudden have zero dollars, yeah. and then you're trying to. I'm trying to prove how much money I had in mm-hmm. my account. Mm-hmm. They're like, "Well, we've got nothing here." Good luck getting it back. Right. The thing. The thing that I mean, uh, that'd be crazy. The thing that keeps us relatively safe is it's a lot of it's decentralized. So like this bank will own their data. This bank over here will do their thing. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, so I have no idea how any of that would work, but. Boy, that could be that could be very destructive and damaging. Um, and I'm Good sure thing we got a geek squad. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's if there's a if there's constant attacks being lobbed at us. You know, right now as we're talking, I, I'm pretty sure this kind of warfare is being waged every day. Yeah, you know what I mean. So when I read oh, that, I, I thought, it. how yeah. crazy that we could go in there, take out their you know part of their their military just through a cyber attack. Not a single bullet launched. Not even a soldier. You know, gone didn't go anywhere. Just, just a bunch of com- angry guys around computers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just Cheeto <laughs> fingers. <laughs> and, <laughs> they, they go in to kill another drone. They hit a button and they, it's you know. <laughs> Look at this <laughs> malware bomb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you've been fooled. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some shit pops up other. Yeah, crazy. I got something I'm really excited about. September 10th, dude. We've got uh, not only is. Bill Burr, his Netflix special. Oh, I love him. Oh, I love One him. of my favorites. And I've seen the teaser for it. Looks hilarious. I can't wait for that. Same day, also, uh, iPhone 11 coming. Oh. It'll be Whew. interesting to see what they're doing right now. Is the, it any different? You know, the, the big race right now, so the big race amongst all the, the phones is uh, battery life, how long it lasts, and how mm. quick it can recharge, mm. uh. which is, I mean, obvious, right? It's what the market is demanding, but it also speaks to... Our our phone uh, addiction. addictions, right? Isn't yes. that crazy? Like that's the like the number one thing right now. That so they is can, that what they're saying that they're going to have the biggest improvements in? Uh, no, they actually say that the the camera and some other things are going to be uh, the major improvements. Of course, they are trying to. They're always trying to shrink the battery, increase the, how fast uh, it can get charged, and how long the charge lasts. So that's always you know that that technology right there. That's that's some of the most. Uh, important technology that we work on is this: mm-hmm. how do we store energy yes. and transfer energy without losing a ton of it? Like when you gather energy from the sun with solar panels and store it and transfer it, something like forty percent of it is lost um, yeah. each time you do something like that. So, That's what, yeah, a lot of people don't realize, like what goes into that, and like also storing in batteries. We don't have the type of batteries that can store as, as much energy as you'd like, you know, from a lot of these like wind turbines and like you know, so we could get more of this mm-hmm. free energy that's out there. It also kind of scares me though a little bit because it goes back to the thing that I've been worried about forever is that we just we keep moving in this direction. God, I was what well, yesterday I was uh, I was walking with Maximus and I was doing my my questions when I was doing his walk right. So that's like the new thing that I do with him every every day. And um, I'm on my I'm on my phone answering questions while I'm walking with him, and I'm at the park and I'm like doing laps. And I look up, and there's only like four or five other people that are like walking around the park and doing things. And it's like they're all these moms, and all of us at the same time are all on our phones like looking down. I'm like, yeah. whoa, this is weird. I just yeah. think that's so crazy to think. And here you are out there with your kid. I'm out here with my kid, and like, and I'm like glued to this phone in front of me. And I, I, I mean, the, the only thing I'm grateful for is that I'm fucking aware of it, right? Like that I'm like, 
Because I, I, you got to think how many people are just mindlessly doing that, just the getting re- sucked in, sucked in, sucked in. Because you grew up in time without it, right? You yeah. know the difference. Well, it's it's weird that if you really think about it, it's weird how this piece of technology has literally become an extension mm-hmm. of ourselves to the to the point where think about it this way. I already know the answer. It, it, one of my the biggest fears of losing something um, used to be your wallet. Fuck, if I lose my wallet, what a pain in the ass. I'd way rather lose my wallet than my phone. Hundred percent. Oh yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. It's just such an extension, and so much I have to do on it. That well, it's, it's damn near. It's pretty much replaced your wallet. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it, I mean, it's, it's it's your wallet and a bunch of other things all built into it. I mean, you have crazy. your. You have it gives your, me panic thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I was along those same lines. I was reading, uh, and, and these stats are pretty obvious that like most uh, teenagers, it's like ninety five percent of teenagers have access to a phone, have a phone. Yeah. Uh, and so the schools are like paying attention to this, and so. Already, there's a thousand schools committed to uh, Yonder, I believe is the name of the company, but they provide those magnetic pouches that can basically lock up your phone. So they're going to start implementing that within the schools. Did you guys see the the article about the dad who created the app? That uh, yeah, yeah, I sent that. Yeah, did you, yeah. Did you did you talk about that? No, no I haven't no. talked. About oh that. yeah, that was what was that? Like he has to answer his text to his parents before it locks it locks his phone. Locks it out. Yeah, that that is, I loved it. That's hilarious. <laughs> I think that's dad brilliant. tech. Yeah. you know, like no, yeah, that's, that's a little brilliant. fist bump I put out there. <laughs> no, that's a good idea. I think it's smart that they do that with students. It's super distracting for kids. They're not there doing what they need to do. They're not connecting and they're not socializing. Oh, and, yeah. And My brother's a teacher. I mean, he tells me that all the time. That's a constant battle. What a hard thing, though, for a teacher because at the same time, too, I think like, oh, man, how awesome it would have been to have the phone and Google when I was a kid going through school because right. I feel like, man, it's so easy to – if there's something I want to learn about today, which it, it still baffles me that we're, we are in these times. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that – if I really wanted to learn about something, like I had to go down to your local library and actually start looking and reading in books and taking hours to mm-hmm. figure that out or asking somebody much older and wiser than me and giving them to drop the knowledge, whatever, right? But you literally can sit down, you know, about a topic and it just seconds read, read for the next hour to two hours and like learn so much mm-hmm. on a single topic. Like, that's pretty fucking amazing mm-hmm. that we have that. It's and awesome. So as a teacher, mm-hmm. I would I I'd, I'd have this real hard challenge of like, well, you you want to teach your kids to be able to use this mm-hmm. this this incredible you want to incorporate it. Right. And they, and it's going to be an important part of our evolution, but then at the same time warning them of the the dangers of the addictive part of it, like what a tough the part for me balance. that I, the part for me that I find most fascinating is that we're all instantly extremely knowledgeable by extension so yeah. because we have a a phone that connects to the internet we now have very quick access to all information most information that's ever been recorded so now we instantly are knowledgeable right. but we totally lack wisdom yeah, there is do you no wisdom retain there. any of that yeah and, and there's no wisdom i don't because know that you're retaining any of it people need the, 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 the there's a big part of there's a lot of value in the process of seeking information that we've lost. You know what I'm saying? Mm. The process of seeking information, talking to people, talking to experts, asking questions, having discussions. Well, there's a lot of lessons. That's gone now. There's yeah. a lot of lessons in the mistakes on the way to the truth. That too. Yeah. I mean, that's that's. A, I mean, we were just having a discussion with uh, one of our guys who works with us before we got on here, and you know, real quick, we can we can have a debate about something as as simple as like autoimmune issues, and we were talking about dermatologists, and you know, there's a lot of science that says. You know, it has nothing to do with nutrition. They haven't linked anything to do with like mm. your skin, if your skin is whatever. And it's this battle back and forth. But, you know, what? And I'm somebody who goes to a dermatologist who that's exactly how they've told me for years. And it wasn't until the vitamin D thing that, that you shared with me, Sal, till way later that I pieced that together. And it just reminds me that like, man, when you just, when you Google something and it tells you that, the, oh, this study has proven this, but there's there hasn't been enough trials and examples and experience and there's not enough information around gut health for us to 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 know about that to to speak in certainties about a, a topic or a subject just because you googled it and this is what we know now yeah. can be very dangerous and something that you learn when you have to do the the legwork of learning and 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 going the wrong it's direction. It's learning how to learn. Like right. Like you have to go back to teaching people how to even do that. It's right. crazy. Like critical thinking. How can I, you know, think my way through this to, to get the right answer? Like it's the process of getting there that you you get all the gems. Well, let's use fitness as an example because that's our our area of expertise, right? Um, I could look up and find information that will tell me 
this is like, let's say you, let's say you follow listen to mind pump and you, and we tell you if you work out this particular way, it's wrong. Here's what you can experience. Don't work out that way. And it's good information. Okay. That's, that's good. And that's, that's good that we have that information, but there's a little, there's a different level of understanding when you've gone through and experienced it because you've tried to learn and feel what it feels like and know what it feels like. It's a different level. It's a type of wisdom. And what we're finding is that the, the journey is far more valuable than the destination. And oftentimes what we're doing is we're getting rid of the journey or we're changing the journey so radically that there almost is no journey. There is no journey in mm-hmm. learning mm-hmm. as much as there is pull up the information. I know it. I don't have to retain it because I can access it whenever I want. And for people who, who are disagreeing with me right now, just think in your head, see if you can remember more than three phone numbers. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you can't. I guarantee most people listening to this podcast right now don't know more than three phone numbers. And if you do know one or two phone numbers, it was probably your childhood phone number because that's back when you had to remember things. But we've outsourced that so much that now I don't know my girlfriend's phone number. I talk to her every single day on the phone. I don't know Jessica's phone number. I couldn't tell you. If my phone broke, I'd be fucked in terms of getting a hold of her. And that sounds simple, but when I was a kid, I knew... All my aunt's phone numbers, my grandmother's phone number, my parents' phone number. Yeah, your good friends' numbers, yeah, I your knew, parents' numbers. Yeah, you know, and it still sounds silly, but again, what, what's happening is we're becoming very knowledgeable, but we're losing a lot of the wisdom, and that can be a little bit dangerous. I think it gives us a false sense of you know where we're at. Like, oh, I know. Well, and in, in our field, I know things. In our field too, I know things. When you do studies, case like good good studies do a good job of controlling a lot of the environment and isolating things. And in real life, that's just not how it happens. True. And so uh, you can take a study and we can control it with you know ten thousand people and they all have this situation. We feed them all a certain way. We do this thing. But the reality of it is like that's nothing like real life. And in real life you know, that person won't have a lot of those controls or that person might have something completely different. And, and those variables could make a difference in that outcome. Here's a great example of that. So, and again, we'll stick to health and fitness. You, if you look at studies right now, the current research, so it could change later on, but right now the current research shows that if you want to live a long time, like a really long, long, long time, that one thing you could do that seems to work is eat a very, very low calorie diet all the time. So a sub-normal calorie diet will seems to improve longevity in, in most animals, including humans. Okay, great. This includes low protein, low, I mean, everything's kind of low. Not to the point where you're malnutrition, but definitely lower than what we would consider optimal for physical performance, mental performance, and quality of life. And that's the part that you won't get from that study. Now, I know, sure, that may be true. But I know that eating some more protein and some more calories will make you stronger, give you more energy, probably improve your mood a little bit, make you feel better. And that's the wisdom that comes in. Well, not, says, o- not only that, you're also – what makes that study true is you're also comparing to the opposite side, which are the, all the people that overconsume and eat – Like crazy. Right. Yeah. And so they're the example that you're comparing to. So, oh, like when you compare that, the person who overconsumes all the time – Versus somebody who, for for long periods of time, is under consuming and eating in a deficit. Yes, the deficit mm-hmm. shows. But what about the person who that has a much better balance of the two of them? That sure. sometimes they live in a deficit, sometimes they live in a surplus, and they have a really good relationship with food and exercise. Yep, like, yep. So exactly, there's just. It, I think it's important that we stay humble. I think that's the point, right? Be humble. We don't know everything. Yeah. You know, even though we know everything, yeah. we don't know everything. There's right. a lot that we can learn. Right. I think would be the lesson. First question is from Lindy Lazur. How to know that you're ready to start a cut? What is the best way to cycle between cutting and bulking? Okay, this is a common question. Um, I think we've done enough episodes now where we've kind of talked about the potential negative effects about cutting your calories too low for too long and how difficult that is to maintain long term. And so because of that, I tend to get, and I don't know if you guys get questions like this, but I get them relatively often where someone's like, okay, well, how do I know then when it's time to cut? Like, when can I reduce my calories to get leaner? Um, This is going to be different from person to person. Um, I like to, I used to like to tell my clients, when you're at the point, when you're able to eat a amount of food where you feel very comfortable and you think you would be comfortable even eating less than that long term, that's the point at which it's probably okay for you to start a cut, or at least it gives you a better chance of 
hitting a caloric level that you'll be able to maintain long term. Now, it's not perfect. And the reason why it's not perfect is a lot of people's appetites um, are not necessarily based off of hunger, but many times based off of other factors. And so they never tend to feel satisfied because what they're trying to satisfy is unsatisfiable. You know, like I eat because I'm stressed, I eat because I'm anxious, I eat because I hate myself or I'm depressed, in which case, there is no amount of food typically that'll satisfy you. I, I've I've known people to be totally stuffed and uncomfortably stuffed with food, but still eat because they feel sad or whatever. So it's not perfect. But if you're otherwise self-aware, I would say get to the point where, for example, if I'm a man and I want to maintain, I feel like, okay, I think I can maintain realistically, comfortably uh, at 2,400 calories a day, let's just say. Then I want to get my calories as I'm, you know, building my metabolism, building my muscle, I want to get it to where, you know, 2,600 calories is kind of what I'm eating. Then I can drop it down to 24, get leaner and kind of maintain that or maybe a little bit lower than that. I, I like this question because it's hard to answer. Um, because like you said, Sal, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of exceptions to the rule. There's a lot of variables that come to play, but it's also something that I deal with uh, still on a regular basis. I'm here right now, so that's why it's kind of a cool question right now too. Um, you know, since I've had Maximus six months or six weeks ago, uh, we have a, a very sedentary job now. Uh, we we sit on a podcast all the time. Uh, we're either in front of a computer, in front of a phone. We're flying a lot, sitting a lot, and then now, and anybody who's had a, a child knows that the first six weeks or so is a lot of holding him and laying on the couch pretty much is I watch a lot of fucking TV right now. You're feeling and, a little fluffy. Yeah. So I am, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm softer. My, my body fat percentage is definitely up. I'm, I'm training though. Right. So I'm lifting, I'm lifting weights right now and, and I'm, I'm, t I'm building a little bit of muscle. So that's good. Uh, but what has happened during this time, uh, I've dramatically reduced my caloric intake. I'm only eating like twice a day. I eat twice a day. I'm probably eating around, 3,000 to 3,500 calories or so. And that's maintaining for me. Sometimes it seems like it even puts on body fat for me. And for me, I've been a, as high as in the 5,000 calorie range before and not putting body fat in. So I know what it's like to eat that much and not get fat, which is what I love about having a metabolism that is burning 5,000 calories a day is it, uh, it gives me a lot of flexibility. It allows me to, on Fridays, have cheeseburgers with Katrina and feel great from it, not feel like it sets me back a week in, in, in my progress. So here I am right now. I want to lean out. Like, so, you know, the, the, the guy who wants to be more aesthetic, looks at himself in the mirror right now. And I go, man, I want to, I wish I was a little bit leaner right now, but then I assess my training and my diet and I go, well, fuck, I'm only eating two times a day, you know, and it's 3000 calories, sometimes even a little less than that. You know, do I want to cut myself down to 2,000 calories just to lose a couple pounds of body fat right now? I know I could do that. I could say, hey, Adam, let's try and go for, you know, an hour walk uh, every single day and let's, you know, cut your calories to 2,000 calories a day. And absolutely, I'll drop a good, you know, three to seven pounds of, of body fat. Now, why I won't do that right now and why I've decided not to do that right now is I know, to Sal's point, that once I do that, that's now my new maintenance level is now eventually the body will adapt to that new calorie intake. Let's say it was 2000 and okay. So I leaned out and I'm feeling a little bit better about myself. Maybe I'm not all the way as lean as I'd like, but I'm leaner than what I was two weeks previously. But now my body is used to only eating 2000 calories. And now I have a choice. Either I need to kick up more cardio and more movement and burn or more intensity in my workouts or reduce my calories even further. Now, this is a, a rabbit hole that a lot of people get into that sends you into a place that is really tough to maintain once you get to the goal. And so I think it's very crucial when you're trying to decide, is it time to cut or not, that you take this into consideration. And so because of that, my goal for clients, and this wasn't until later on that I really pieced this all together, and like my goal for myself right now I don't worry about it. So I'm a little fluffy right now, and I'm going to be carrying a little bit of body fat. Right now, I'm my goal is to build. I'm going to just, even though my ultimate goal is to lean out and I want to be leaner, I'm, I am I, I reframe my- You're my, going with the flow. Yes. Yeah. I, and, and I'm going to, instead of fighting my body and cutting calories, 
I'm going to keep my calories where they're at. In fact, I'm actually kind of boosting them a little bit and kind of flirting with closer to the 3,500 calorie range, really pushing the volume in my training and strength training right now and trying to build and put some mass on me because I know that for every pound of muscle that I can add to my body, it's going to speed my metabolism up. Now, my goal right now is actually not to move anything on the scale, not really to lose any body fat. It is, can I continue to eat more calories and not get any fatter? And the way I don't get fatter is I end up building muscle instead of putting body fat on because my training is there. And my goal, just like it is for clients, is to reach a point where I go, fuck, it's getting hard to get that many calories. That's always a good sign for me that it's time to go the other direction. If I am having a hard time getting enough calories in the day because my my calories are so high, that's a very natural good place to switch and go the other direction. So that's what I'm waiting for. That's the advice that I give to clients is, well, if you're at a place right now where you're just satisfied I don't normally like to take you and start cutting you from there. I like to try and build your metabolism up to where you look back at me as a client and you go, fuck, Adam, you got me eating five times, six times a day, and I'm eating freaking 25, 2,800 calories if I'm a girl. If I'm a guy, I'm eating 4,000 calories. This is hard. I'm like, great. Now, let's start to cut. Because then when I ask you to reduce 500 calories, you're in a very comfortable place, and now you're in a caloric restriction, and the body starts to drip. Right. And one thing you said, too, is you're because you're, because you're eating a little bit higher calories for your level of activity, you're focusing on building muscle. And right. So what you want to do is you want to make these calories work for you. So you're either going to store the calories as body fat or turn into more calorie-burning machinery, which helps you more down the road. So if you're thinking about doing a cut, it's a great idea to, to work up to a cut by building muscle and giving you a better place to start with is basically what we're this talking about. This is how about. I did every before every show, and I used to tell clients that are competitive, right, the same thing. That the real hard work to competing on, on on a stage is not done during your cut for the show. It's dur- it's done leading into the cut. Did you do a good job of building a roaring metabolism so that when I do decide to kick cardio up, if I do decide to restrict calories, the body responds and you start to drop really fast and we have a long way to go. You totally. have a lot of room to keep doing that every two to three weeks. Totally. Now, the second part was what's the best way to cycle between cutting and bulking? Okay, so uh, it, let's let's just assume everything's healthy, everything looks good. I would say spend more time in the one that is your goal, but spend a little bit of time in the opposite. So let's say your goal is to bulk. Um, I would push calories and workouts um, and stay consistent for – now, a couple ways you can do this. Um, you could go one day a week – eat lower calories, but the rest of the week eat high calories, or you could push it a little longer. Um, Some people have a lot of success going two or three weeks for a bulk and then eating two or three days or four days at maintenance or a slight cut. And then reverse that. If you're cutting, you could do the same thing. Two or three weeks of consistent cut with, you know, four days or five days of maintenance or slight, you know, surplus or bulk, or do the, do it, break it down over the week, you know, five or six days a week, it's a cut. One day a week, it's maintenance or a bulk. Those Both those options seem to work best. And this is from experience. Um, there, is a little bit of it, uh, uh, there is a little bit of science that supports what I'm talking about, but most of what I'm talking about right now is based off of working with clients and experience. But I found those two cycles to be generally the better ways to approach it. Yeah, I just tell them no cuts, no butts, no coconuts. So, <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> Our next question is from Michael Vanderloo. What are some unseen benefits of the farmer's walk? Farmer's walk. Ooh, yeah. I didn't get into doing these until Map Strong. When we put out, I've done farmer's walks before. I had to sell this on you guys. Yeah. And, and well, I mean, for, my, for Map Strong, it was obvious. If well, that one, yeah. Yeah, you watch strongman competitions, they have to hold stuff and walk on them. But you're right, Justin. You used to talk about them all the time as being great muscle builders, mm-hmm. but I always was like, "What what specific muscle am I working?" You know, I know it's good for tension, right? And, and I understood on paper it's value, but yeah, never increasing really- mus- muscular tension. You know, great for like reinforcing good posture, um, and just overall a good muscle building exercise. Uh, and just isometrics in general, I've always been a fan, just because. It, you know, it, it's really good for the joints to, you know, experience, uh, you know, that kind of support where, you know, I'm getting my whole body to learn how to really brace and tense on command. 
and still be able to to move and have that kind of support uh, through movement. So, you know, for the farmer's walk, you can really load the farmer walk too. So another thing uh, that's great about like adding more of that volume and adding more of load within your workouts, like a farmer walk is, is a very easy way to do that. One of the unseen benefits that I know, and again, Justin was somebody who really got me doing this. I mean, I mean, I could count on one hand how many times before him that I had probably incorporated a farmer walk and it's now a pretty regular thing that I, I add in there. And one of the things that I noticed, and it reminded me of, it took me all the way back to like my early twenties when I was training with these like power lifter guys and they were trying to get me to squat. And like at that time, like I could like barely squat a plate and they stuck like three plates on my back and they're like, you know, they, they wanted me to squat and feel that. And I'm like, you're fucking crazy. I can't even do two plates. Why do I have three on here? And he's like, your body needs to get acclimated to feel, it needs to feel the weight. Like that's how they just explain it. Yeah. You just need to learn to feel the weight. And, it, and it, what, what I noticed from that was he was right. Like, you know, before that two plates was scary as fuck. But once I felt what three plates felt on my back, all of a sudden two plates didn't feel so scary anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think a similar unseen benefit from the, the farmer carries, cause you could load them so heavy, right? A lot of people can, can farmer carry more than they can chest press more than they can even squat more than they can deadlift. Well, maybe not what they can deadlift cause you got to deadlift it to get it up. But most people can, you can, can get a lot of weight. Yeah. You can do a lot of weight doing the farmer carries and, and you're moving walking, right? So what I noticed with it, it, and you're holding on to that, when you're holding on to two, 300 pounds like that, then go try and grab 100 pound dumbbells and chest press it. All of a sudden, I felt that to be a lot easier. So oh, I noticed like- it turns, your, it turns your CNS, your central nervous system on. Mm -hmm. here's, a, here's an experiment that you could try right now. Take your right hand and squeeze it as hard as you possibly can. Now, if you're doing that, you'll notice that the rest of your body also tensed up. Now, all you're trying to do is squeeze your right hand, but instinctually, you tense your entire body, other muscles that have nothing to do with your right hand. You, mm -hmm. you probably tensed up your left hand and your feet and your face and your core just so you could squeeze your right hand more. And that's instinctual because it works. If it's you beneficial. Were to, it's, if you were to squeeze a gripper with your right hand as hard as you could, but keep the rest of your body completely relaxed and then do it again, but this time tense up your whole body, you're far stronger when you tense up your whole body, even though the rest of the muscles of your body directly have no effect right. on that hand. There's no direct effect, but there's this indirect yeah. CNS signal that happens. And what farmer walks do very well- They like increase your amplitude they, in a sense. Totally. They turn everything on and they, 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 change the, they, they change the set point. So think of it this way. Think of your central nervous system as having a safety set point, if you will. Your body will only let you access a certain amount of your total potential. And this is actually true. This is true. Olympic lifters who train very, very consistently um, at a appropriate intensity and do very explosive movements, they have been tested at being able to uh, hit something like 90% of their total potential. The average person is somewhere around 30 or 40%. You just can't access the actual strength that you have. And it's because your body's trying to keep you safe. It doesn't think it can. But when you test it by doing a farmer walk where you're walking with this heavy weight and you got to do it right. Don't, don't, don't hurt yourself, but to challenge yourself. So you're tense, you're, you're tight, you're walking with it. The whole body is working to maximize your output. Then when you go do the rest of your workout, your CNS is your, your, your output went up a little bit. You've now increased it by a couple percent within that workout. This is literally within that day. So they've done this with studies on, on heavy lifting. If you were to do like a heavy single squat and then go jump, you get a higher jump than if you didn't do the heavy single yeah, squat beforehand. Yeah. It just turns on your CNS. It's like what I talked about the other day when you, I go heavy deadlift and then go over to do pull-ups. I feel like I just fly up when I start, totally. doing, start doing the pull-ups. And that, that's what I, the unseen And it's not just like you feel that way. It's real. No, no. Mm -hmm. it's, no it's obvious. You can get way more reps out. The weight will feel lighter when you're doing it. Like do this. Go do the farmer. Do heavy farmer walks. And then go over and go do your your heavy chest press or go do heavy single dumbbell rows mm -hmm. after that. And you'll feel like the way you pull that weight or you push that weight Dude. after you've just got used to holding on to 300, 400, however much weight you can do a farmer walk with, all of a sudden 100 pound dumbbells don't feel like anything. If you value strength uh, and performance at all, you need to really value your central nervous system. You could... The reason why you're stronger when you have caffeine in your system, and studies will prove this consistently, a certain amount of caffeine, people will lift more weight. 
or why people on PCP or crystal meth are so hard for police to stop is because those are strong central nervous system stimulants. The reason why a parent can lift a car off of their pinned child in an accident, there's actual, uh, there's actual case studies where you have a 140 pound, you know, mom m move a car to save their child. It's not because she instantly grew all this new muscle. It's because in that situation, the CNS was turned on. You can actually train this in your body. Farmer walk is one of the best ways well, to do yeah, it. Well, yeah, not just that. It's to elongate that process. So to build up that, I always, you know, I talk about this ad nauseum about work capacity, but it, in terms of being able to control and, and maintain that level of tension, this helps to train that so you can elongate uh, the amount of force that you can produce in, in each exercise. So, you know, if there's a, a, a point of a lift where you always struggle, where you feel like, you know, there's there's not as much power output. This will help to kind of train you to sustain the the level of power output that you had going in. Next question is from Britt Maxton. What are your thoughts on powder based meal replacement shakes and the meal replacement concept? Oh God! You yeah. know what this this makes me. This is such a great example, and I love it that it's in our space uh, because we could comment on this meal replacement. What a yeah. great example of uh, our, the a humans' natural narcissistic arrogance. Like we're so arrogant that we think. I mean, this is the truth now. Okay. Besides the brain, the brain is the most complex thing we've discovered in the universe by far. The next most complex thing is mammalian metabolism. Our, how food is processed and used in our body is extremely complex. And we still don't know, we still don't understand all of it. For example, it wasn't that long ago, I think it was like less than 10 years ago, maybe even shorter than that, that we discovered that breast milk that women produce for their babies changes depending on the time of day that she's producing the breast milk. Morning breast milk. Wakes yeah, that was a recent study. Yeah, it wakes the baby up, breast milk at night, helps the baby sleep. We didn't know that before. We were giving yeah. baby formula, and we're like, oh, it's got proteins, carbs, it's got you know some the fats. essentials. Yeah. We've got nutrients in there, so it gives the baby everything it needs. Powder-based meal replacements will keep you alive. Okay, right. you're, they're not gonna. You're not gonna. You're this, probably, is, this is Soylent's entire pitch. Yeah, you're 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 not gonna die from them. But they're definitely not ideal, and we're so arrogant to think that we can create in a laboratory a food and a powder that's going to give you optimal life. And remember, being alive doesn't mean you're living. Just because you're alive doesn't mean you're living. Living is, is far more complex. Here's the other part of it that we completely, completely negate and don't even consider. There's a psychological component that's huge that comes from food. Oh, yeah. You're going to cut that all completely out? The enjoyment you get from making food, eating food with friends, sharing in the different flavors and textures mm -hmm. and experience from food. Think of all the emotional connections you have food. A lot of them are bad, but some of them are good. Let's just get rid of all of them and now get people to just have – and that's what they sell. They sell like, it's oh, it's super convenient. You don't have to get up from your desk. You don't have to worry about you know food anymore. It's cheaper. Just mix this up in your water, drink it, and now it's you like mindless your body. eating too. No, you're not a car. You know what I mean? Or just put gas. Well, the the, con the concept it's of it and why it works is because it controls that for most people that need that control, right? That's why they're successful with it. The reason why I think something like something as silly as like Slim Fast could be around for as long as it's been around and and work for so many people is because those same people you know, we're, are too lazy to weigh their food or measure or track or pay attention. It's just much easier for them to say like, hey, instead of swinging by Subway or having your, your sandwich that you normally have for lunch, have Slim Fast instead. Yeah. And it's a whole 135 calories, you know what I'm saying? So that's the concept of it and why it could potentially work for people is just simply the calorie restriction. You go from somebody who doesn't track calories or over consuming or under reporting and now all of a sudden they have this little tiny controlled drink that's only got a few hundred calories. I in wonder, it. is there somebody out there that's like tried to live off of just liquid, uh, like a liquid diet? Oh, like how long it's gone? The soy, the Soylent guy. I know. I want to yeah. know like the the <laughs> the length he was able to like keep you, it up. You, you could survive. You absolutely could. Yeah. You, you yeah. absolutely. That's why. I mean, you could do it, but I mean, like, what a like a horrible existence. Well, and, and you know, there's probably somebody who's listening right now too. Is like, well, aren't you guys sponsored by a powder? We never tell people to replace their foods. No, with, that's with, the last thing I would say. Right. No, 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 no. Well, that, that, but I think it's important to bring that up because I think some people just don't get that. They hear they hear us talk about a product and think that that we would recommend it like that, and we never would. It's just bottom line, you know, is it does it does it have value sometimes? Sure. Like if I'm and how I use it and how I tell clients to use it is. 
You know, if I tell you as your trainer that uh, I need you to get 130 grams of protein, that's what you should be eating on for optimal performance and results in your goal. And it's eight o'clock at night, you had all your meals already, and you're at 75 grams of protein. Uh, I think it's an excellent choice to be able to do something, whip up a shake real quick and have that. Do I think that's better, though, than you actually getting under there, grilling a piece of chicken mm -hmm. and having some rice and broccoli? No, definitely not. But the reality is a lot of people would choose a, something that's way worse or skip the intake completely completely when their body needs that extra protein. So to me, that's that's how things like this should be used. Unfortunately, the money is behind people using it all the time and as mm -hmm. much as possible. If it's got 30 servings in it, I want you to get through that in the entire month. So these companies try and make the case for it that it can replace a meal. It's better for this. It's convenient all the time. Oh, let's do this. And so now it's turned, with, and what I hated in, in our space is I used to get clients, and I know you guys have had the same situation where I'd have clients that hire me and they'd be like, you know, I, I got my trainer, I've got my shakes, I've got my bars. Like they, they think that it's it's a healthy thing for them to do is to add this into the diet. And I'd be like, well, why did you do that? Do we need that or do you need They would eat that specifically instead of lunch. Right. You know, things yeah. like that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And we also don't know what we don't know. That's my that's my whole point about food. There's still, a, we, we discover things about food still today all the time. Now, I do think at some point we might figure it all out. But I don't think we're there at all. And so, and I'm referring to people who are replacing meals with these powders, like the Soylent, you know, powder, where their whole thing is just drink these all day long. You'll never have to get up from your desk. You could totally work all the time and whatever, and mm. and you'll be healthier because it's you know we made the it's perfect promoting good habits. Yeah, because we've made the perfect food. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think it's a good idea at all. I think it reinforces a bad relationship to food. I think it prevents you from. Developing a relationship with uh, with food and, and good understanding that is anything that is any that resembles anything that's long term. If you want long term, I've never met anybody who lost weight with liquid, you know, protein shakes or, or or meal replacement shakes through replacing meals. I've never met anybody who had a long term. It's never been sustainable in my, in my experience. Yeah, there's no long term exit strategy. No. Okay. Oh, then well, what are you going to do after you lose your your hundred pounds? Oh, then I'll go back to regular eating, you know, regular food. Yeah. Oh, you mean. Like you did before, because you didn't have you don't have the relationship with food that helped you do that properly. You're just gonna jump back into it. Oh no, we have a strategy. Like that's the hard part. Yeah. That's what you should be working on. Working on right now. Exactly. Next question is from Danny Matrenga. You talk about the importance of one's relationship with food and exercise. How does one maintain a healthy relationship with money? Oh, good question, Danny. Oh, hey, oh Danny. wow, Danny finally hey, asked some guy. good questions. Yeah, this guy. is the first time he asked a really good question. <laughs> I think <laughs> we should give him a little star, yeah, ribbon, no, or something. No, he's, our, he's a good yeah. dude. Danny. For those of you who don't know, he's our he's our head trainer. Yeah, super, he's, he's super our guy. Super smart kid. He's all over our our, uh, our YouTube channel. Do you know why this is a phenomenal question? I, I learned this recently, relatively recently, that you you look at nutrition and exercise and and how people can develop a bad relationship with them or a good relationship with them. And once you develop a good relationship with exercise and nutrition, you have this balance, this natural balance. You take care of yourself, you eat right, you exercise, it feels good. It's not this crazy struggle back and forth. Same thing with money. Same thing with money. People who tend to have money issues, it tends to be because they have a bad relationship with money. Such, right. a, such a good point. And it's, it's, don't it's you so feel funny. like there's the, the same type of oh, extremes too, the right? The impulsivity, right? It applies to money just like it does food and everything else. Dude, I, you know, it's funny. I, I had a, a friend whose family had constant issues with money and, you know, they would always either be in debt or couldn't pay bills. And you'd see the gifts that they'd buy each other for Christmas and they were ridiculous, expensive presents and stuff. And I know they're being very, you know, they're trying to be, you know, good and nice and show their love. But I remember thinking like, that's a, that's a bad relationship with money. You're always struggling with money. And then when it's time to buy a gift, you spend $500. Right. You know, that, that shows that there's a little bit of a, a of an issue with money that you don't necessarily respect it or value it, you know, in a healthy way. So this is something that I think people need to work on. Um, in those studies, they have studies on, on lottery uh, winners. I talk about that all the time. Like people will win the lottery and two years later, they're broke. Or you have celebrities who are totally broke. Michael Jackson, you know when he died? He was something like $500 million in debt. Oh, really? Even after taking the Beatles uh, catalog? Yes. 
Five hundred wow. million dollars in debt because he had just this terrible spending habits. Oh, I didn't do. know that. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So um, this too many Ferris wheels. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Well, what do you what do you think about your your per, your personal relationship with money and and how have you managed that? You know, I grew up. Um, so both of my parents are immigrants. Um, my mom came here when she was four. Uh, my dad came here after he married my mom. Both of them very poor upbringing. So when my grandfather, my mom's dad, came here. He had very little skills, um, you know, that were applicable to, you know, the new place that he moved. He became a custodian, worked his ass off. It's funny, my family, the exact people that, you know, programs are designed for that are supposed to help them. And no one in my family's ever enrolled in any of these programs because they're always about like, I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can and find every opportunity I possibly can. I'm not talking down on people that need help. It's just an it just kind of sh highlighting kind of the attitude that they have. So my grandfather worked seven days a week. My mom grew up, you know, lower middle class, but they they never bought things they didn't have money for. They saved every penny. My dad grew up very poor. He started working full time at the age of nine. So nine years old, he had to go to work. Didn't go to school anymore. Um, and when my parents got married, my mom would tell me, you know, I remember as a, as a real young kid, my mom would take napkins. And she'd open them up and she'd break them up into four squares. Mm -hmm. She'd tear them up. And she used cloth diapers with me and my sister um, because they couldn't afford diapers. When we would go out to dinner, like a bit like, oh my God, hey, hey everybody, we're going to go out to dinner. It was a big deal. It was McDonald's. We'd go to McDonald's. Remember this as a kid. You know, that, that was a big deal. Um, we were never in debt. My parents were able to raise four kids, have a house that they were able to pay and my dad had uh, no further education than I think third grade, um, and he worked very, very hard and very, and they saved a lot. And so my my relationship with money was work hard and save. Now that's good, but it's not great because right. I never learned the other side of it, which was invest. Yeah, it was all about saving, save, 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 and didn't know anything about investing. So then when I was, you know, 19 years old, managing gyms, um, I was one of the top performers at a big fitness company. This is back in 1998. I was making uh, 100, I made 120 grand, I think that first year, which for a 19 year old is a shit ton of money, especially back in 1998. I never bought a, I didn't buy a house. I didn't buy, I didn't invest in the stock market. All I did was put it in the bank and live at home with my parents, mm. which was better than I think a lot of kids would have done. But I wish I had that, that other person in my life that could be like, hey, what are you doing with your money? Like, you got you got all this money saved up. Let's take, 40,000 and buy this property and, and, and well, teach I, how to invest. I, you know? I also think that there's, I think it's a spectrum, just like there, and I love that you started with the analogy of, of exercise and food and how that, and I think there is what we, what most people would think is a really healthy relationship could be borderline unhealthy too on the other extreme, right? There, so there, I think that there's extremes on both ends of the spectrum that Somebody who has a terrible relationship with it, they buy $1,000 gifts for Christmas when they barely make $500 a month is totally irresponsible and they never have money and they're broke and whatever. And then there's the other person who makes all this money and they save and invest and they put it all in these things like this and they never spend it or do anything with it. Yeah, I you, think, you could become a miser. I think that's- You could make all this money and live in like yeah. a little shack and- you know. Right. Yeah. I think I think that's unhealthy too. The, the funny part about it, there's so many social constructs that are that are surround money. It's really it's really an interesting topic and a, and a topic that I like to talk about and, and learn about and think about because really all it is is fucking paper. It's really just a way for us to exchange things, right? 100%. Uh, I go to work every day. I work really hard. I get paid for that, right? That's why I, and then what I do with that is, well, you know, I, I can exchange that money for something else. Now you can save it and exchange it for security because some people value that highly, or you can exchange it for things because some people value that highly. But really, I think it's understanding that balance. And I think to your point, Sal, that you know when you really get at control of it, I think you have a really nice ebb and flow. Um, you know, I, I personally save and invest, but I also I also spend. Like I I, I don't I have friends that um, save everything. Man, I my, I have a buddy of mine who may may have as much, maybe as uh, saved up as me, and makes significantly less than what I do, and. And is always thinking about investment in the future, um, but I also I see the way that he lives his life, and I think, man, that's so crazy. You have all this money in the bank and invested, and 
you know, you're and you're you're worried about you know having a second streaming service because it's three ninety nine a month. Like that's to me crazy. If there's a show on there that you really love and you enjoy and, and it gives you fulfillment to watch it, but you're gonna choose not to do it because three ninety nine times twelve months adds up to a whole fifty or sixty dollars that you could have used. Like, yeah. so I really think that there's also a balance too because then you could spend your whole life preparing for the future, which may never come for you. What or are you may, really working for? Or may get taken away from you. Mm -hmm. So I think I think sometimes we we look at at money and we we give it this thing so much more than what it really is. Well, it really is just an exchange for your labor if, that you if you compare it to food because it's easier for us to communicate. I think when it comes to nutrition because that's what we I have a very I have a much better grasp of what a bad relationship and good relationship to food is, or at least I can communicate it better than when I try to communicate with money. So when like with food. There's eating for enjoyment. There's eating for health and, and sustenance and performance. When does it become pathological? Mm. It becomes pathological when I'm eating to fulfill something that can never be fulfilled with food, mm. right? Mm. If I'm trying to eat because I'm depressed or I'm numbing myself or I'm distracting myself, now it's become pathological. Okay, so if I'm buying things because I'm trying to distract myself, right? Because I'm fulfilling something that cannot be fulfilled with money. Like I'm lonely. So I'm going to spend tons of money on- I'm going to go to the mall and just shop. Yeah, or buy friends. Right, hang out with my right, friends and pay right. for everything because I'm lonely. Right. Or, or I'm insecure and so I'm buying these things so I look more powerful. I got to have a nice car so everybody thinks I look cool. Right. Not because I really enjoy the car or whatever, because it, it, it fulfills- it, I'm trying to solve an insecurity through money. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes pathological. So if you can, if you can examine that, be honest with yourself with that, what tends to happen, this is what tends to happen. The people that I found that I think have the best relationships with money, they tend to have the stuff that they kind of value and they don't have the stuff that they don't value. So like I used to, I, I used to have a, uh, I used to train a lot of executives and uh, high achieving um, doctors and surgeons. And I remember I, one guy that I trained, I, I love training him because his attitude towards money was one of the healthiest I've ever seen. Now, he was a vascular surgeon, and he was a damn good one. He probably would make, I'm sure he made close to three quarters of a million dollars a year as a vascular surgeon. He was a badass, and he was working all the time. This guy drove a 1999 Nissan, uh, it was like one of the SUVs, like an old Nissan SUV. It had like 200-something thousand miles on it. <laughs> And he worked out in a shirt that had holes in it and shoes that were kind of old. Now, at first, I was like, God, is this guy like a – is he a miser? Like, is he just, just work, yeah. save his money, not spend any of it? So I remember asking him, like, why do you drive – why do you drive such an old, old-ass uh, uh, Nissan? He's like, oh, I fucking love that thing. He goes, I throw my dogs in there. They get it all dirty. It's been with me forever. I don't really care about whether or not I bump into things with it. Um, I just enjoy driving it. And he goes, you know, at home, I have a Porsche. I had no idea. I'm like, oh. You have a port. He goes, yeah, I like that too, but I use it for other things. And I'm like, well, why do you work out in your in these kind of workout clothes? I'm working out. He's like, I don't care what this looks like. Went over to his house just after a year or something of training him. Gorgeous house up in the hills of Los Gatos, and I knew that he really valued privacy. So he had land. He valued privacy, and I could see the stuff that he put in his home were things that he truly mm -hmm. valued. And I remember thinking like. Oh, like he doesn't spend money on what everybody else thinks. He he doesn't have to walk around with flashy clothes. And that's okay too if that's what you value. But my point is he didn't. Therefore, yeah. he didn't spend the, the, his money on those things. So I think that's where you start to look at the pathology. So like if you're looking at your money like I, and you're making money and you're thinking, you know, I'm sad. I want to go shopping at the store to make myself feel better. Well, that's probably a bad relationship with money. You know, you might be better off taking that money and investing it so it can work for you and grow and, and develop some, you know, I've, some well, I've shared on the podcast a long time ago that I, I built this kind of formula. And I'm not like completely, you know, strict with this ever, but it's what kind of had me, it started me in the right direction of a better relationship with, with money. And that was at the end of every month, I would look at like all my normal bills, your cost of living, food, things like that. And whatever sum of money that I had left over, I would invest or save half of that. And then the other half, I would allow myself to spend. Mm -hmm. And the harder I worked, the bigger that number became. Yeah. You know, if I got better at my craft, I worked harder, uh, the number that I was able to save and spend on myself was greater. And if I wanted something bigger or nicer, and I and it would take more than two or three months of saving, then I would just keep 
saving that money away and then I would go and spend it and, and buy. But I would always do that where it was like I was never taking all of my money, blowing all of it on something and then like having to wait for the next paycheck to get me by. I was like, so I just created this good habit of, you know, putting a little away, spending and enjoying a little bit. Now, older, way beyond all that, I have just a nice ebb and flow of, I know if there, if I've been in a, in a, a streak of, you know, indulging in spending on myself, then I'll go the other direction and I'll make sure balance that I'm, it yeah, balance it out by investing more and saving more of the next couple of months after that. So I have this really nice, and really what it is, is just having a good relationship with money. But I do believe that there is, you know, there, there is just like there is with food and exercise, a big spectrum and there's extremes on both sides. And just like in fitness where we look at the people with the amazing bodies and they're all ripped and shredded. And we think, oh, they must have the best relationship yeah. with food and exercise. Right. Oftentimes it's the worst. Right. And sometimes just because somebody has all kinds of money, right. And, or has all kinds of things that you would think, oh man, they got it all together when it comes to making money or having money. Uh, sometimes those ones are, are not at all. And I, so I think there's a nice balance of the two of them yeah i think i'm still learning you know i think that this is one of those things i've been i definitely was raised more in like a blue collar kind of a setting where i never spent you know outside of my my means and you know when what i worked for equated to what i was able to buy and you know getting beyond that for me and learning how to better optimize you know my investing strategies and be able to uh, make my money make money uh, is something that I'm still I'm still reading and learning and, and trying to you know get better at and implement for my family. So therefore, you get like all those main things covered, all the rent, all the you know day to day things that need to be accounted for. Everybody's living to where it's you know all all those like foods on the table, the lights are on, mm -hmm. you know the main utilities are. So I just making sure that's all established. Now it's like okay. Uh, since, since I've sort of established that now, how do I be better? How do I optimize? I feel like this is just, this is a whole nother leg of my experience with money. Yeah. Let's talk about debt because, um, debt to me in, if I were to compare it to nutrition, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, it would be something It would be like fasting. Um, you can utilize debt and be smart with it and improve your financial, stability and circumstances, you can be very smart with debt. In fact, some of the most brilliant millionaires and billionaires in the They'll world tell you to go in all kinds of debt. know how to work through yeah, debt. Yeah. But most people do not have a relationship with money at a level where they can do that. Where debt becomes a big problem. The way I view debt is this. If I, I, I have to want something more than I don't like the debt. In other words, I, I almost never am in debt, but mainly because I never really want anything bad enough mm. to go into debt. Now, a house is different. A house, I may want a house, right? I've had one, I've had several in the past, and um, I'm, I, I want that house, and I, I don't mind the debt to have the house. But like a car, for example, I, and this is just me. I'm not a huge car guy. I've realized this to myself. I don't value it so much that going into debt to own a car doesn't bring me a ton of value. But again, that being said, Debt is a tool. It's an advanced, I would consider it an advanced tool for the average person. If you knew, if you had a good relationship with money, a healthy relationship with money, you could utilize and manipulate debt in ways to benefit you. But people have such a poor relationship with money that debt becomes a bad, it becomes terrible. And you see these people who are just, you know, the average American, I think, has something like $15,000 of the credit card debt. Yeah. And what do they buy with it? Now you got a massive hole to get out of. Yeah, and what are they buying with it? It's not like essential shit, you know well, what I mean? Well, de debt with a debt with a car and debt with a house are two different things, too, because, and, and there's, of course, there's two camps that would argue that with the house and stuff, but a house would still consider, and it is, it is a liability, but it's also an asset, and it's mm -hmm. also an investment, sure. where a car... You know, unless you're, much, unless you're buying like a rare car, right? Like a classic. I consider yeah. my 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 Camaro is a, was an investment. That's actually what made me funny. That we're talking about that. We what made me buy the Camaro. I remember when I had saved up enough money to go out and go buy myself a hundred thousand dollar whip, and that was like a big goal for me. I'd saved up this money to go buy myself, and the younger you know kid in me and the the ego wanted to go get something flashy and new. I wanted to go get some flashy new car that was awesome. And I thought to myself before I did it, and I was, I was shopping all these different vehicles. And I and I'd always liked classic Camaro is a is a car that my my real father had and drove. And it was something that I always wanted as a kid growing up. And I thought, you know what? I can kind of do both here. I can get something that I've always really wanted, but then also it be something that's an investment. You know, anybody that has classic cars knows that 
you know, on average, most of those vehicles go up between six to 12% every year, just because every single time one gets in an accident, the value of those things go up because they're even more rare. But things like that, I think, are the other side from classics are things that are regular cars are, are a, a different type of debt than like a housing debt. So any sort of debt that I were to consider putting myself in, you know, running credit card to go buy a bunch of uh, electronics or buying a car, I'll never do it unless I have the cash saved. So like when I when you know when I go out and go buy a really nice car, I have that I already have that cash. I'm doing it for the leverage to to build mm-hmm. credit and and that because sure. mm-hmm. we live in a world now where that does matter. And I was you're using debt in a, in in a right in a smart way, right? You know where a lot of people don't understand they don't have the a good they're not advanced enough with the nutrition to go and use fasting for their health. You right. know what I'm saying? Yep. It's the same thing. Like you, there's a basics that you need to learn and basic rule number 1 is uh you know work hard and make money. That's number 1. Um and don't spend what you don't have and save money. Like if you can't get that down, right. you can forget about investing. Yeah, don't get yeah, involved with the strategies. Yeah, th- you're just going to fuck yourself up. But if you get that down, then you kind of graduate to the next level like okay, I can save money. I don't spend more than I that I make, um, and I, I have a consistent job. I work hard. Now I can look into how do I use debt, leverage mm-hmm. debt, and how do I invest so that I can continue to make this grow. But it's there's- funny. I always tell myself slow to spend. You know that's sort of like a rule I have because it's just again like those impulse buys and those things like it's tempting at first, but for me it's like dude, okay if I keep thinking about it over and over and over, then you know it's dude, something I'm going to consider. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot like food when you think about it. That's why totally. It's, that's why it's a great yeah, it's question. Like, yeah, it's a it's a lot like food. It's all these. It's all relationships that we can become pathological. You know, there's a I don't know what the number is, and I'm, I'm pissed off. That I don't remember this, but statistically speaking, people in the in lower incomes. Um, in comparison to higher incomes, spend a much greater percentage of their income on luxury type items. So I'm not saying that they buy more luxury items, but a greater percentage of their income goes to shit that they probably shouldn't buy. Right. So you'll see a lot, you, a greater percentage of people in lower income spend money on things like jewelry or cars or electronics as a percentage of their income than things that are considered luxury, not necessity. Than people who and cigarettes and things like that, things that are not necessary but that are kind of just money killers, a greater percentage, and that's because a lot of times people who don't have a lot of money, a lot of that has to do with the accumulation of the bad relationship that they have to food, uh, excuse me, with uh, with with money. So it's like over time, these people could it be in a higher bracket of savings and wealth, but because they when they get money, they spend it on this stuff that's not very smart or they have a bad relationship with money. They kind of keep themselves down there. And you can look these statistics up and they're really crazy. Oh, a lot of that's, I mean, it was the, this is something that I battled with as a kid in his early 20s who was making good money. Like I wasn't rich at 20, but I was making six figures, which for me, that was a lot of money. Of that six figures, probably 90% of it was spent on exactly what you said (laughs) because it was more about everybody else. It was more Mm -hmm. about the insecurity that I had with being successful, coming from nothing to wanting to show everybody that I am successful now. So therefore, here I am buying all these flashy things, spending all this money on everybody else, picking up bar tabs all the time. And so I was a classic example of that. And most of the time, when you see people like that that have lower income that spend a majority of it, it's because you're trying to look as if you are wealthier than you really are. And what you don't really know is you're really shooting yourself in the foot for long-term real success and wealth. That's right. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.